Dr. Frank Longo is a professor of neurology and neurological sciences at Stanford, um, as well as the chair of the department since 2006, and one of the national experts recognized on Alzheimer's disease. Um, Dr. Longo's, Longo's research team focuses on novel mechanisms that prevent neural degeneration and promote regeneration. He and his colleagues have pioneered, I hope I get this uh, correct here, the uh, development of small drug-like molecules that target neurotrophin receptors to delay the onset of slow, of slow progression of Alzheimer's or other disorders. Um, prior to that, he was at the University of North Carolina where he launched or expanded programs on Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, stroke, epilepsy, sleep disorders, multiple sclerosis, and Parkinson's disease. So one of the best guys I could get up here to give this talk. So thank you very much. Frank? So what I plan to do is uh, bring everybody up to date on some of the basic underlying events that are occurring in Alzheimer's disease. We'll talk about th things that cause it, uh, how to prevent it, all in the context of aging, in the context of the design theme for today. Try to wrap up in 20, 25 minutes and then save time for, uh, for questions. So Dolores did a nice job setting up and you've heard multiple times today what a huge problem this is. I always say to everybody, for those of us planning to live to 85, either us or the person sitting next to us will have this, so it's probably relevant to, to pretty much all of us, um, unless we can come up with things, which we are. <clears throat> so anybody who's at all interested in the brain or aging, let alone a dementia, needs to know what a synapse is and what a spine is. This is just basic knowledge, so I'm going to put you to work, because we can't have an intelligent discussion without having for once in your life seen a spine or a synapse, okay? All right, so we have 100 billion neurons in our head represented by the blue circles here. Um, and so they have dendrites, as you can see, arrayed on the left, inputs coming into those dendrites, um, and an axon heading toward the right here, uh, forming a synapse or a connection uh, with a spine on this dendrite of the next axon. So the messages are going from left to right, through this circuit or this chain of neurons, um, and this act, the message is going down the axon into this uh, end of the axon here, the synaptic bouton, um, and there's a little gap, but a connection uh, with that spine. The, this little, those beads or extensions along that dendrite are called spines, and this connection here is called a synapse. Um, each one of these neurons, we have 100 billion neurons, could have 1,000 or even 10,000 synaptic connections. So we're talking 100 trillion or more synaptic connections in our brain. And in real life, um, here is a dendrite, this green long structure here, and those little nubs coming off of that are the spines. Okay, and that's how they look. This is how they look in a normal situation, and we start to lose these spines. These spines are probably the most delicate part of this whole arrangement. Uh, we start to lose them with aging, and the loss is especially dramatic in Alzheimer's and some of the other neurodegenerative disease. Now, at what age uh, do we start to get some impairment of this synaptic connection? Is anybody in this room over age 28? Um, if so, um, you're starting on the slight gradual downward decline of, of the function of these synaptic connections. Um, and so the goal is, of course, is to minimize or prevent that, that, that decline. I'm gonna show a video of, of these spines now. So in this kind of image, including the video I'll show you, we don't see the incoming axon, but they're there. They just aren't visualized. There are axons coming in, and then you'll see these spines. The reason, you're, and you're wondering, why is he showing a video? Um, I mean, we all know the only organ in the body that really moves is the heart. Um, brain doesn't move, it just sits there. Well, I'm gonna disprove that urban myth now. The brain is a very dynamic place. Right here as you're sitting in these chairs, I'm gonna show you parts of your brain. Uh, that are moving, and everybody in their life has to see this video at least once. It blew me away the, the first time I saw it. Uh, maybe you can put, put that on. I... And this will be a loop. So again, we're looking at these uh, dendrites, and these are the spines. They're extending and retracting, extending and retracting. This is a highly dynamic process where these spines are extending, looking for that axonal partner. They, they're driven to form this synaptic connection. Now this loop is sped up. What you're looking at is really happening over about a 30 or 60 minute time period. But there, it's this dynamic process. The spine's extending and retracting, looking for that axonal partner to set up that connection. Now what stabilizes that connection? If, it's if the connection is used. 
if it's used, will stabilize that connection and it may last the rest of our lives. If it's not used, that spine will just retract because it has no purpose in maintaining uh, that extension. So if you remember anything from today, you may have stabilized a few of those uh, connections, okay? So the brain does move. The heart's not the only body, organ in the body moving, and it moves in this fascinating way right now. And this is important because the things that dictate the ability of those spines to maintain that drive to form connections is influenced by many things in our lives that we'll talk about in terms of normal life, in terms of aging, and in, in terms of Alzheimer's. So we'll go to the next slide. Let's go back to the regular slide there. Great. Okay, so what happens in Alzheimer's disease? Well, basically, one hears two terms quite commonly, amyloid accumulating in the brain, so-called amyloid plaques, and tau tangles. So amyloid uh, is a fragment of a protein that's normally in the brain, um, and this fragment accumulates in these clumps called plaques. This fragment's also floating around in a soluble solution in the brain. In low levels, it probably has some kind of normal function to en enhance brain function. Nobody really knows why it accumulates to these excessive levels in Alzheimer's disease, but that little fragment of amyloid is highly toxic to those synaptic connections. And if you want to wipe out a spine, expose it to too much amyloid. Um, so it's thought to be a play a causal role in this disease. That's the main hypothesis. Again, there are other hypotheses, of course. And the other uh, main thing that occurs are, is there's a protein called tau that's in our neurons. It, pro it has a number of functions for normal neuronal function. Uh, that tau uh, uh, gets into an abnormal shape or conformation, accumulates inside these neurons, and it causes the neuron to degenerate and die, leaving what's called a tangle of tau within that neuron. The neuron degenerates, and then the tau tangle is just sitting there by itself. So if we were to take an Alzheimer brain, sit down with a pathologist, look at a slice under a microscope, we'd see plaques and tangles. The diagnosis would be, diagnosis would be Alzheimer's. That's the bottom line of, of how this looks. Now, how is this accumulating <clears throat> in our lives? So, as I mentioned, any of us beyond our late 20s currently have the diagnosis of age-related cognitive impairment. Okay, so we're all, a lot of us are in it. For those of you who haven't reached that point, you will. Okay, so we're all in this together. Um, and then, later on in our lives, we get to this stage called subjective cognitive impairment, where we're thinking, you know, my memory's just not working like it was a, a few years ago. But you come into our clinic at Stanford, we formally test you, and it's all normal. And We test everybody in the context of their age group. It's all normal. Your day-to-day -day activities are intact. You say you have subjective cognitive impairment. We, we don't know where one will progress from that. Some of us will move on to what, this condition called mild cognitive impairment, so-called MCI. That's when you'll come to our clinic, and our testing does show that for your age match peers, you have cognitive performance that is statistically significant below your age match peers. But your day-to-day -day function is largely intact. If you're working, you're still at work. Uh, if you're doing day-to-day -day things, they're still generally intact. Although, if you're doing something really hard, your colleagues or your family might start noticing some subtle differences. But since your day-to-day -day activities are intact, we call that mild cognitive impairment. To meet the definition of a dementia, your, both your testing has to be impaired and your day-to-day -day activities have to start being impaired. Then we use the term dementia. And of course, Alzheimer's is the most common of 30 different dementias. Alzheimer's accounts for two-thirds of the dementias. It's the big one. Some people use these terms interchangeably. Generic, dementia is a broad generic term. Alzheimer's is the most common cause of, of dementia. So another way to look at this, and this is really kind of how, how the field's emerging over the last couple of years, is through a, looking at a graph of time here on the x-axis. I described these states of our lives, normal cognition, subjective cognitive impairment, MCI, and dementia, and some measure of something getting worse. And the big surprise is those clumps of amyloid are accumulating in our brains 15 or 20 years before our first cognitive symptoms start. And this just shook up the whole field. We used to say, your Alzheimer's was starting when you started losing your memory or some other part of cognition. But 15 or 20 years ago, the amyloid started accumulating when you thought everything was fine. Completely new and powerful insight into how we manage this uh, and try to prevent it, design around it. 
Finally, enough of this amyloid's accumulating that we start to, as represented by this darker blue line, get some neuronal injury, the spines being the most delicate thing, the synapses being the first to go in this injury. Now, as this injury occurs, as we're losing the synaptic connections, enough will happen. We have reserve. Uh, we have redundant connections. But when it gets uh, high enough, we will start experiencing some subjective cognitive impairment. Finally, we'll get enough injury where we have mild cognitive impairment. And when we kill enough uh, connections, it, we'll have a dementia and, and into cognitive loss there. So what are the risk factors? Uh, one is how you picked your parents, um, just the raw genetic, genetics of it. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Synapse number, some people just have more synapses than others, and it's thought that um, that creates a redundancy, so that person has to lose more synaptic connections before their symptoms are manifest, so their onset might be later or they may never get it. Uh, education level, so-called cognitive reserve. Uh, during education, presumably, we're creating more synapses so that when we start to lose them, again, our symptoms occur at a later time. So education level correlates epidemiologically with risk for dementia. The break point, though, interestingly, is whether one has below a roughly an eighth grade education compared to above that. And I thought that was an interesting point I looked into because I get asked all the time, if I go to graduate school, will that help me? Um, I Probably not. Or if, even if I go to college, I don't know how much difference it makes. The break point's way down around eighth or ninth grade uh, from, from what I can see. Um, Brain injury and inflammation. Idea here is we have a little concussion when we're kids, sets off a little low-grade inflammation. We're fine, we don't even know about it. Um, but inflama inflammation mechanisms contribute to some of these Alzheimer mechanisms. Um, and so that's maybe why we're at higher risk for uh, Alzheimer's as we get older if we had concussions when we were younger. Do you have an E4? Up to 30%. Now, if one has one parent with Alzheimer's, it gets much worse. Uh, if, if one has no E2, let's say one's a 3-3, three, 30% three, lifetime risk, one copy of E4, up to 45%. If you're unlucky enough to have a parent with Alzheimer's and you're a 4-4, four, 60% four, lifetime risk. Now, how do you know if you're an E4 or not? This used to be available through 23andMe. You spit into a tube, mail it in, you could find out. A lot of people I know have done that. And the, if you recall, a couple months ago, the FDA shut down that service, saying there just wasn't enough data for it, et cetera. If you come to our clinic at Stanford, we could order this for you, but I wouldn't do that. I would you know, think very carefully about that, because I don't know if you want on your medical record that you're at high risk uh, for Alzheimer's disease. There are implications for disability insurance, life insurance, all kinds of stuff, and, and who knows. Um, and um, we can talk about this later during the questions. Do you really want to know this? Um, what will you do about it? Um, how do we incorporate this kind of testing in our lives now? Because this will become more and more common, especially since it's commercially available uh, more and more outside of the healthcare setting. You can't put this genie back in the bottle. You find out you're at high risk for something, you're stuck with that, okay? How will you deal with that? Can't change your mind, can't pretend you don't know. How will your spouse deal with that? How will your fiance deal with that? How will the person on the third date deal with that? Should you tell them? Of course not, just the third date. What happens, <laughs> but what happens when you get engaged? Well, why didn't you tell me? Or when you get married? Well, why didn't you tell me? Is there, when you think about it, these are very tricky situations to get yourself in. I, and I uh, started a genetics, uh, neurogenetics clinic when I was at UCSF. I got into hundreds of these very complicated uh, discussions. This is a, a very tricky area and it's becoming much more much more common. And finally, right now, we don't have a drug proven to delay onset. However, once we do, yeah, I, would, I do want to know if I have an E4. Uh, it'll change the equation very quickly, but we don't quite have that yet. So what we do every day in our clinic, um, you know, when we assess the possibility, uh, we take a careful history, we do a careful physical exam, we do cognitive testing, we get a brain MRI scan, uh, we'll get some blood tests, low B12, low thyroid can cause a dementia, we don't wanna miss that. We're about 85% accurate, that's not good enough. I mean, for a diagnosis like this, do you want me telling you, well, I'm pretty sure you have Alzheimer's, but not entirely, um, anything else we can do for you? Um, 
So we need to get this up to 99.9 percent. We just don't have the technology yet. And one of our big uh, research uh, areas of focus is really developing better diagnostic modalities to get this to be much more um, accurate. Um, it's still pencil and paper time. We'd love to have better technology to, to do cognitive testing. Uh, we will ask you to take a blank piece of paper, draw a clock, put the numbers in, and make it say 245. Hopefully you can do something like this, uh, but over time, uh, if you're going through these stages that we talked about, this is what your performance uh, might, might look like, un unfortunately. And uh, we try to quantitate this, this type of uh, thing. But we're still left with pencil and paper tests uh, in, this, in this field. We'll get an MRI scan, and people think, okay, the MRI scan will tell me if I have Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or whatever. This, this is a perfectly nice looking MRI scan that you can get today. It tells us absolutely nothing of whether or not you have Alzheimer's. Uh, it's gonna take a more advanced technology. Tells us there's not a big brain tumor. Tells us there's not a big series of strokes. We like to know that. Brain tumor can present with memory problems and dementia. So we, we do get the MRI scan, but we need much better uh, imaging uh, technology. And I'll share some of that work that we're doing here, here at Stanford. Um, more recently, we have uh, PET scans that can detect amyloid. So a PET scan is a technology where a chemical, a compound that binds to those amyloid plaques in the brain, it sticks to those plaques, and this compound has a little radioactive uh, label on it. Uh, so we can detect that radioactivity in the scanner. Uh, so the cooler colors here are a normal uh, brain, and then the brighter colors are a 79-year-old with Alzheimer's, uh, with, and so those brighter colors indicating these amyloid plaques have, have built up uh, in the brain. Now, as we mentioned, um, this amyloid can start building up 15 or 20 years before there's any dementia starting. Um, so the FDA approved this a little over a year ago. These scans are available. We have them here at Stanford. However, Medicare um, and the insurance companies won't pay for them at this point because they're saying, how does this affect care? What are you gonna do with this information? Or you don't have a treatment to start. Uh, the retail price you can pay for is about $4,000. So if anybody wants to see if they have amyloid building up right now, $4,000 and we can order it for you. But like the genetic testing, I advise our patient be very careful you really want to know your brain is full of amyloid right now. What will you do differently? Do you want your insurance company to know that? Were you thinking of getting disability insurance? Do you want them to know about that? Um, very, be very cautious uh, uh, with this. Um, but that, the accumulated amyloid doesn't tell us anything about how the brain is functioning. And in fact, if we took uh, normal 70-year-olds, a third of them have some amyloid in their brain, and they're fine. So what does it mean? We need imaging that tells us about what the brain's doing. And uh, my colleagues here at Stanford, led by Mike Gracious, have really pioneered uh, this area of what we call resting state functional MRI that allows us to look at the activity of brain circuits in living humans as they're laying in the scanner. And this has really been a revolution uh, in our field. Um, his team can take a healthy elderly people and those orange circuits are circuits that connect to the hippocampus and are vital for memory and they're quite readily visible in a normal person. Take an early Alzheimer's patients, they're losing these memory circuits, and we can see that in the living person. Uh, this is not accurate enough yet to be in our clinics, but it's where we're really pushing this so that we can look at your circuits that are vulnerable to Alzheimer's at any age, uh, at any time. So in the future, what we'll be doing is at some age, depending on your family history and your unique situation, We'll be looking at multiple genes, including APOE. We'll be looking at other things in your blood, protein patterns, fatty acid patterns that might predict in five or 10 years uh, your risk for getting Alzheimer's. We'll do one of these more advanced brain scanning technologies, and we'll put this whole thing together and customize for you, okay, you're off the hook, you're, light, you're not gonna, some, the bus will run you over, but you won't get Alzheimer's disease. Or, um, you know, you know, by age 58, unfortunately, you're gonna be having your first symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. And then once treatments become available, we can decide, is it worth the risks of, the, every drug has risk, is it worth the risks of you starting this at age 50, at age 55, at age 40, uh, whatever. So you can see what the future is bringing. So what we'll have to design are approaches that can take all of this information unique to that individual, the genomics, the blood, the scanning, the family history, 
and help us quantitate some risk benefit of which drug to take at which age, all customized to that person. So you can see what will be evolving over the next uh, five, five or 10 years. We won't be passive victims, hopefully, but we'll be very actively intervening to reduce each, each of our, our risks. So I'd like to, with what we have now, talk about, again, in the context, broad context of aging, but including Alzheimer's, approaches and hopefully designs to minimize these risks from what we know now. We see a lot about, on the left, brain exercises. They're getting more and more sophisticated and powerful. You may have heard of Lumosity and Posit. Uh, we're hearing more and more about what we should be eating and not eating, including the Mediterranean diet and variations thereof. And we're seeing a lot about exercise. Those are three big approaches right now for delaying onset of age-related cognitive impairment as well as dementia. Now, which of these three is the most powerful? If you can only do one, what would you do? Um, exercise? Is that, anybody else have a different opinion on that? Uh, food? Food? I mean, you hear a lot about the food. How about these, these soft, all this software for brain exercises? There's been a lot of attention lately. Um, so, well, I don't know if I want to give the answer. Yeah, we'll go through these three. But one, is, one of these is, is, is I think, the, in my opinion, the most powerful thing that you'd be crazy not, not to do. Okay, so um, what about brain training? Um, and this is work from Adam Ghazali's group up at UCSF. And it's one of a number of studies emerging addressing this issue of how helpful is brain training, generally you know, on, with software. And the critical question is, is there a spillover effect? So if I sit in front of a computer and get really good at cognitive text, uh, task X, there's no question I'll get better at that. And if I have early dementia, I'll, you know, it'll make up for my dementia. I'll be better at doing X. But will, will there be a generalization or a spillover effect so that by doing those exercises, I'll be less likely to lose my car at Stanford Mall? Um, in other words, is, is there a, a global generalized effect? That's the controversial question. Um, and this attempted uh, to address that. So they gave, uh, these were uh, uh, subjects, um, um, normal subjects, and they were given either, they had two different single tasks on the computer. One was just driving, keeping this car on the road. Uh, the other was looking at this visual cue and with their hand having to move a lever in response to what this cue was telling them to do, called a sign response. And then the third group of people had to do both at the same time, keep the car on the road, but be responding to these visual cues, drive plus sign. So multitasking, which of course is generally much harder than doing a single task. And this um, approach is called NeuroRacer. They did one hour a week, three times a week for a month. So not, not that much. And then at the six month time point, so five months after this cognitive exercise, uh, they were tested. And the group that did the multitasking, but not the other two, were found to have uh, statistically significantly improved working memory and vigilance in the multitasking group. And this was actually published in Nature. It made big news because it was the first like, decently designed study showing that this kind of cognitive exercise affected areas that they weren't directly working on during the exercise. They're suggesting there was some spillover effect and that it persisted for five months after they uh, finished doing this. The effect size can be, they claimed it was a relevant, clinically meaningful effect size, but people debate you know, how significant it is in real life, so I think you know, the jury's still out on that. Uh, this was done with a very sophisticated research tool in a research lab with a whole research team. Uh, they're working on a commercial version, but how this a commercial version would work with you or I in real life, who knows? Uh, so uh, we've got a long ways to go. But this will be a big design issue of how to monitor performance like this and to see how it affects day-to-day uh, uh, -day life. We need ways to monitor people. Whenever interventions like this are developed, we need ways to monitor people through their day-to-day -day life to see if this is having an effect. That's one very important thing to keep in mind here. You don't have to be developing the technologies, but are you developing something to see if the technologies work? That, I think that's the big value. Um, and what about uh, diet and, and supplements? Um, we hear a lot about the Mediterranean diet. Um, and overall, if I just look at all the papers and literature, I'm not a nutritionist, but I try to keep up with this. We're talking about maybe a 15 to 25% reduced risk of getting dementia or Alzheimer's if we follow a cohort of people 
uh, that are on a, a Mediterranean diet. The problem with these studies, the big limitation, of course, is cause and effect. It's almost impossible to do a prospective trial. We're going to take this half of the room for the next five years, you eat Mediterranean diet, and this half of the room, you go to in and out every day for the next five years, and come back in five years and we'll test you. That would be the ideal trial to really figure out the causal role of the Mediterranean diet. But of course, we can't do that. These are just following people who happen to be on a Mediterranean diet. They try to control for all the other factors, but it leaves a lot of, of, of questions. I can't get through a single week without somebody asking me about coconut water or oil uh, to prevent dementia. I keep looking this up. I keep reading about it. I would say there's no reliable data. There's a group in South Florida at Tampa that has started a small randomized trial. We'll see what happens with that. Um, vitamin E, all over the map. Some studies showed no effect. Uh, one study showed higher rate of death for people to take vitamin E. Um, <laughs> Um, and then just in the news a couple months ago, 19% reduced rate of decline in activities of daily living in Alzheimer's people taking 2,000 units a day of vitamin E. But in that study, even though activities of daily living were improved slightly, cognitive function was not affected. So it's a real mixed bag on this. I, I personally don't take any extra um, vitamin, vitamin E. Um, Omega-3 fatty acid, fish oil, uh, has been studied at least once formally in mild to moderate Alzheimer's, and there was no overall effect at these big doses. Um, although people that didn't have the APOE4 allele did have some cognitive improvement, so maybe there's a little something there uh, we still need, need to know. Now we'll get to exercise. You don't have to run marathons. This is something a little more conservative. So this is the Excel study done in women in Seattle in their 70s with the diagnosis of MCI, mild cognitive impairment. If you have that diagnosis, you've got about a 40% chance of going on to Alzheimer's in the next five years, probably an early stage of Alzheimer's in many cases. For six months, they did twice a week of resistance training. So this was the harder group versus hanging out with the same trainer in the same gym, doing a little balance and tone. Not that that's bad, but that was a little, little easier. And it, it, it turned out that the people in the, the resistance training had an improvement in executive function and associative memory uh, after that six months. It's just twice a week of, of something uh, pretty mild. Let's look at something a little more, walking. So this study was designed um, as we age, our hippocampus, key part of, of in our brains for memory, um, real lot of delicate spines and synapses there, shrinks at about a volume shrinkage of about one or two percent per year in all of us as we age. Now you figure I can lose 1%, who cares? But it's like an interest-bearing account. You add that up year after year after year. You do not want to be losing 1% to 2% of your hippocampus um, each year. But that's what happens if we plot volume and over time we get the shrinkage. So they thought, we'll take a bunch of people, we'll have them walk starting conservatively at 10 minutes a day. These are people that normally weren't exercised and we'll gradually build them up to 40 minutes a day of a brisk walk, we can talk about what that means. And we'll follow them for one year, and then we'll repeat the MRI scan and measure the volume of the hippocampus. And the hypothesis was, we'll slow the decline of, of volume. We'll, we'll slow that atrophy in the walkers versus the non-walkers. That's what they were, were testing. And the shocker was, they didn't slow it. The hippocampus gained volume in these people that were walking. It actually reversed the effects of, of aging uh, by, by walking. This was, I think, five days a week. This is a very, very powerful biologic effect. We're reversing age-related brain shrinkage. And if, if I had a drug that did this, um, everybody would be buying it. And I, th people would be paying a lot of money for it. Um, and if I told people that the side effects of this drug were less diabetes, less hypertension, and less depression, those are the side effects. Every treatment has a side effect. That'd be something. Um, now, we can't get anybody to take this drug. Um, and, and so I think we need to design devices or whatever that really give people serious feedback. I mean, I tell my patients, um, you know, they come to our clinic at Stanford because they're concerned about a memory loss. You know, again, that we all have, but they're concerned that, you know, it might be more serious. And, you know, we find, can't find much wrong sometimes, good, which is good uh, in terms of brain tumors or serious problems. But they're concerned about this memory loss. And then they come in with all this stuff and all, from all these websites about, 
uh, this supplement and this nutraceutical and this software and I'm doing my brain exercises. And then I just have one really simple question. Tell me what about your exercise. Well, I don't, you know, no exercise. Okay. Hours a day on, on websites, but no exercise. Um, and so I'm, when I deal with this biology, and we're studying this in my lab at Stanford, effects of exercise, it's starting to seem almost as amazing as somebody smoking three packs a day and then going to the lung clinic and complaining about a cough. Um, if you don't exercise, well, of course your memory's not going to be functioning normally. We're, you know, we're designed to cover six to eight miles a day. Now, fortunately, something like 30 minutes a day, five days a week, probably does it, of what we call modest. Modest is three ways to define it, but one way, a slight sweat after about 10 minutes, or if you're walking with a friend, you're not comfortable talking in complete sentences the whole time, or you can calculate 65% of your predicted maximum heart rate for your age. You can play around with those different things. Just come up with, for you, what's a modest, it's a brisk walk, basically. So I tell my patients, you know, not everyone can walk that comes to our clinic, but if you're still able to walk, you have this amazing gift and you have this incredibly powerful biologic treatment. This is powerful as the most powerful drug I know about, um, but you need to decide whether you're gonna take it or not. Don't waste it. Um, so I'm wearing my Fitbit, because um, I wanted to see what it's like to do personal monitoring. And I'm kind of an uh, addict. I, you know, I run seven days a week anyway, so I thought, well, I don't really need to wear this, not me, but I wanna see what it would be like for my patients. And now it's changed what I'm doing. So Instead of walking up uh, going up an elevator, when I have to go to a meeting, I take the stairs. Because uh, my kids want to see how many stairs I climbed when I, when I come home. So I think this personal monitoring is so critical for us. I want to be able to walk in. I want to be able to see what my patients are doing on their day-to-day -day, um, exercise. And they're not always honest with themselves or you. Um, and so we, we, this personal monitoring, I think, is more than a fad. I think it's just, it's just vital for us to take care of patients. Um, sleep and Alzheimer's. I showed you these amyloid PET scans. It looks like people that sleep less than six hours a night, and again, you have to tailor this. It's probably individually different, are accumulating more of this amyloid compared to people that sleep more than seven hours a night. We're in early days of sleep and Alzheimer's, but this is where this whole idea of not enough sleep as a risk factor uh, coming up. Uh, we do have some FDA-approved therapies for Alzheimer's, but really they just boost the neurotransmitters at the synapse here. They can make memory function a little bit better temporarily, but they're not slowing the underlying progression of this disorder. They're not slowing the degeneration and loss of synapses. So we do start all our patients on these drugs. It can help a little bit, um, but um, we, need, we need to actually slow, prevent or slow the disease down. Uh, what has been tried are making antibodies uh, to attack these amyloid plaques and clear them out of the brain. Uh, here's the result of one study. There's some amyloid plaque on this PET scan. Patient was treated for 18 months with antibodies to attack amyloid. Did lower the amyloid load a little bit. So three big phase three trials were done in the past few years of treating mild to moderate Alzheimer's with these antibodies. Unfortunately, all three trials failed. Um, the Alzheimer's patients didn't get any better. And the thought is maybe they needed to be treated earlier in the disease. Maybe it was too late by the time they had their uh, significant cognitive symptoms. So now the field has moved to prevention trials where people can be treated with these antibodies who are at high risk, who are very predicted they will get a dementia, but let's give the antibodies before the dementia starts. Um, and there, these are some of the genetic families. There's a big one in Medellin, Colombia, uh, where they're they know that at age 42, they're gonna start having a dementia because of the gene that runs in their family. Uh, so she can get her antibody treatment before the dementia starts and maybe it'll, it'll delay it. It'll be a few years before we know if that, if that works or not. Um, and another approach is to prevent the synaptic uh, loss. There's a protein called brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. It's the most potent thing known uh, to maintain synapses, prevent losses of spines. Like most proteins, it's too big to get through the blood-brain barrier. We can't really use it as a drug. It declines as we age. It declines dramatically in Alzheimer's disease. So our, our team here at Stanford was the first to design a small molecule to mimic a key part of that protein. So this small molecule, this drug, does what this protein uh, does. We can test uh, mice with Alzheimer's. We've got a, 
A uh, neuron in the hippocampus of a normal mouse has these beautiful dendrites and those little nubs off those dendrites, this is blow up here, are the spines uh, that I showed you. In a mouse with Alzheimer's, they're losing this beautiful dendritic tree. There are less branches here, less spines along there. We give the Alzheimer mouse one of our drugs. They get their dendrites back and they get their spines back. Uh, this would be amazing if we can do this in people. So we're trying to move these studies from mice uh, in, into humans. Um, and to do that, uh, this is what happens to a lot of our therapeutic technologies. They have to go through the valley of death. And fortunately, the valley of death, I think, is a little shorter for software or devices. So those of you working in those areas are really lucky. If you're developing a drug, this is a massive valley where almost everything dies. Uh, this is why. We can start off the research uh, with NIH grants in an academic setting. Uh, it's really hard to get to this point of showing that something's uh, working in a mouse. Um, but what I was showing there on the pipeline, the large pharma companies to do these more advanced trials um, won't take up this technology unless you've got some human uh, data, which is incredibly expensive. And so there's no funders for the middle of this pipeline. So large pharma funds the last stage, NIH grants fund the first stage, and nobody funds the middle because it's too risky. Um, we got the, no problems. We got this. So if, if you, uh, phase one, you t see if your treatment's uh, safe in normal volunteers without Alzheimer's. Uh, for example, we have a treatment where we've done that. Phase two is the first time it's tested in Alzheimer's. Um, this is this middle ground that people don't like to fund. Now, if this works, if you get a, a tentative positive signal in an Alzheimer, small Alzheimer's group, then the large pharma companies will say, oh, hey, you know, let, looks, this looks interesting. We'll pick it up and we'll start the development. We'll do a full phase two and a phase three. Um, but in between, uh, nobody will fund it. Um, and so that's why we call it the, the, the Valley of Death. Um, okay, so I'm going to stop there and take any questions. This, will show, this shows our new neurology clinic where we'll do all this promotion of brain health. But I think for the design theme, I just want to emphasize these ways of monitoring what people are doing in the real world, whether it's exercise, um, cognitive interactions, are going to be very powerful technologies to judge therapeutics by, to judge care by, to give feedback to care providers. I, I think that's just so incredibly valuable. And I look at the Fitbit as just a little primitive first step. Um, maybe that's 2% of the way. But I, I want to walk into my clinic and have a whole dashboard of what my patient's been doing. And I don't want to have to wait till I walk in the clinic. I want it to be monitored the whole time so we can actually call them up and say, hey, what happened? It's been a week since you took a walk. Is there anything wrong? What's going on? Um, you can't do that. And then come and tell me you're worried about your memory. Um, and so I think that kind of care will be um, really important. So of those three strategies, you probably saw my bias. I would say exercise is by far the most powerful. I mean, I've tried to do all three. Um, uh, but exercise, physical exercise is, 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 is the big one. We have the best data for it. It's the most powerful. Um, and uh, people are crazy who are physically capable of walking and, and don't get any exercise. So I'll take questions for maybe a few minutes if the timing's OK on that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Longo. Every time I hear you speak, I feel like my cognitive reserves are expanding, which is wonderful. Um, I have a question about the exercise. If, um, let's say, if I am sitting or sleeping 23 and a half hours a day, and right. then the 30 minutes are reserved for exercise, is there any part of that sedentary lifestyle that um, sort of offsets in a negative way the benefits of the exercise? Does there need to be more consistent movement, or it doesn't matter what's happening throughout the rest of the day if I'm receiving that small, you know, yeah. boost? I think that's a good question. I think possibly what one's doing the rest of the day outside that 30 minutes is probably important. Um, we don't have, the field doesn't have the data to answer that definitively. I mean, people do these prospective exercise trials, and they've only started the last couple of years, and they generally pick something that's attainable 30 minutes a day, five days a week. I mean, that's what the CDC recommends, the American Heart Association recommends that. And then they start to do some variations on that, but they haven't done enough variations where we can definitively answer something like that. So people speculate that two 15-minute periods might be just as good, maybe even three 10-minute periods. 
But then we see more and more about the destructive effects of sitting, sitter's disease, right? So it could very well be that as all of us sit in meetings or whatever, five hours a day, is wiping out that 30 minute gain. We can't answer that with data. So I always figure, okay, I only have one chance at my age of this. I can't wait 20 years for the perfect data, right? So I'm gonna get, I'm doing my exercise, I'm gonna do 45 minutes just to be safe, because who knows? Um, I've started having meetings where I'm walking during the meeting. Uh, that always shocks people. They come to my office and they go, let's go for a walk. Uh, look at, well, look where we are, what a nice place uh, to walk. Um, so I'm just, I'm, I'm playing it safe because maybe in 20 years we can answer it, but I, I don't want to wait that long. Yeah. Uh, yes, Professor Longo. So maybe you can clarify for me uh, the status of uh, Alzheimer's disease research. Do we have a proof of principle? Is there a case that you know of, or multiple cases, where an Alzheimer's disease patient that's been diagnosed has actually had a reversal? So the question is, do we have a proof of principle? Has a patient ever, Alzheimer's patient ever been diagnosed and reversed or cured? The answer is no. Um, there is still debate about the underlying cause of Alzheimer's. So we don't even know what the underlying mechanism of it is. The, the dominant hypothesis is that this accumulation of amyloid is important. However, there are people that say the amyloid accumulation is just an epiphenomena. There's something else that's important, and amyloid is accumulated as a side effect and that too much of attention has been put on lowering amyloid, that won't do it. So um, nobody's been cured, no treatment has worked. Uh, we're, we're at a, that's why if somebody finds something that delays onset or reverses it, it's, it's massive. Um, and it's so powerful that you know, I, I deal with, unfortunately, with patients that have all kinds of serious problems. I mean, you can get diagnosed with you know, lung cancer or pancreatic cancer, it's a horrible position to be in and you get these terrible odds that maybe 5% chance that you know, something will cause this cancer to reverse. We're talking about a field where it's a 0% chance. Uh, the Indian population has the lower incidence of Alzheimer's, and there's been some, some theory about inflammation response, curcumin, and all of that. What's the latest in this area? Yeah, so the question is, the in People in India, there's a lower prevalence of Alzheimer's. There's also research on curcumin and that inhibiting inflammation. And I had mentioned that inflammation, you know, people think it's important in Alzheimer's disease. There's a group at UCLA that's done a lot of research on the curcumin. And they've, um, the native curcumin, if it's taken as a pure source, doesn't get into the brain very well. So they've actually been trying to change the chemistry to get it in the brain better. The more organic people say, well, when curcumin is cooked in the traditional way, there's, you know, it's um, surrounded by fat molecules that get it in the brain. A lot of controversy there. So we don't have any definitive data in terms of you know, Western type of prospective trials. I've heard the speculation about India. It's so hard in these demographics because what are all the confounding variables in India? Maybe people walk more. Like if you told me that the average person in India was more likely to walk 30 minutes a day, I think that's pretty believable. I, I, know, I don't know how, how good the data is considering that maybe 80% of people don't own a car or don't have access to transportation. So how do you separate that out? Um, so that's what we know about. Again, curcumin would just be another additive. We don't have any definitive data for any of them. My insurance on that is in terms of inflammation, I know exercise reduces inflammation. That, that's my approach. Yes? A cognitive exam, a brain MRI, check the B12 level and the thyroid level. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the B12? Yeah, so um, low B12 levels can present with cognitive symptoms, including memory loss and other cognitive symptoms. So when we're doing what we call a dementia assessment. Um, you know, we don't want to miss, well, we want to find out what the accurate diagnosis is. We don't want to label somebody having Alzheimer's when the problem is really low B12 or low thyroid. Um, and most importantly, we never want to miss a, a treatable or fixable etiology. We can fix your low B12, we can fix your low thyroid. So that's what we're doing with these studies.
not blindly, I don't, again, it probably doesn't hurt, um, but I think as part of just a general, you know, your primary care person checking things once in a while, it's nice to know that your B12 level is normal. And just like they uh, periodically will do thyroid levels, just norm, let, see, make sure it's normal. Maybe one more question. Yeah, I don't know who is in the back, yeah. You mentioned the quantity of sleep. Can you comment on the quality of sleep and specifically sleep apnea? Yeah, so all of those are in study now, so I can't say anything definitively, but I think it's quite likely, again, not proven, that all of those factors are important. It's not just the hours, it's, it's the quality of the sleep, um, how many um, wakeful periods there are, all of these add up. And as you might know, Stanford has a, probably one of the top sleep communities in the world. I'm not a sleep physician, but we have a number of them here, and those are all the variables they look at. And what I showed you has just come out in the past year, and so those are all the things everybody's look, looking at right now. So we don't have final answers. My guess is it's the overall uh, amount, dose, so to speak, of high quality sleep. Um, and what's emerging, the mechanism that's interesting is the fluid in the brain uh, uh, that filters through the brain, that filtering process might occur more rapidly or vigorously during our sleep. And so the speculation is that maybe some of this amyloid and probably other things are getting cleared while we're sleeping. And with the lack of that, maybe this amyloid's building up a little, a little faster. So I want to thank Dr. Longo. Thank you.